ですけど。
Uh, Bonnie and I talked about it, and we found a song that is, I think, is just perfect for it. The, uh, the song Danny Boy is one of the most famous folk songs in, well, in recent history. And uh, it originally was a ballad published in 1913 by Frederick Wetterly, and it was set to an ancient Irish tune. And in 1967, gospel singer Dottie Rambo turned that tune into a hymn titled, He Looked Beyond My Fall. So if you'd like to sing the first verse with me, feel free to do so, and then I'll finish the song. <coughs> Are you doing well today? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. I am too. <laughs> Lucas, thank you so much uh, for sharing this morning in special music. You'll want to come back tonight as uh, he will be bringing tonight's message in uh, Pastor Travis's absence. We'll be praying for him today as he uh, makes final preparation this afternoon. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 17, Zephaniah 3.17. Now, Zephaniah is kind of one of those harder books to find. It's a minor prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, you can use your table of contents or go to Malachi and take a left. And it's about four books over. And you will find Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. This morning's message is entitled, A Serenading God. And in this verse this morning, we're going to take a look at five promises that I believe children of God can claim. So let's read that verse together. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. 
He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for a beautiful morning to come to your house to worship. And I thank you for your word and for the truth that we find here. And I pray this morning that you will use this word to encourage our hearts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning in these five promises we're going to be taking a look at, I'm going to break down each of these phrases, and each one is a promise that I believe that we can claim. And the very first one is, the Lord your God is with you. Now, is that an encouraging word to you this morning? The Lord your God is with you. Well, you know what, folks? Sadly, we live in a time of great loneliness. The general social survey found that the number of Americans with no close friends has tripled since 1985. Zero is the most common number of confidants reported by almost a quarter of those surveyed. The other 75% of those people that were surveyed could only list two people that they believe were close enough that they could share some of their, their most personal matters. Loneliness appears most prevalently among millennials. And I believe that has much to do with being connected in the virtual world, which has led to a social disconnect in the physical world. Now, medical research tells us that loneliness is bad for you. Lonely adolescents exhibit more social stress compared to those who are not lonely. Individuals who feel lonely also have significantly higher Epstein-Barr virus antibodies which that's the, the key player in mononucleosis. Lonely women literally feel hungrier when they are lonely. Finally, feeling lonely increases risk of death by 26% and doubles our risk of dying from heart disease. Well, here's the good news this morning. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can claim the promise, the Lord, your God, is with you. Now, knowing the fact that we have Jesus with us wherever we go as a child of God, does that mean that we will not face any problems? No. Jesus said, in fact, one of Jesus' promises that we, that we don't want to claim is this. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Delane and I will have been married 25 years in December. Now, during those 25 years, we have experienced four miscarriages, spent two years helping our elders through a cancer fight. Our marriage isn't perfect. Our kids aren't perfect. Our finances aren't perfect. But through it all, you know who's always been there? Jesus. This morning, if you know Jesus Christ, you can claim the promise that he made when he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So yes, it's a blessing to know the fact that the Lord your God is with you. That's promise number one. The second promise is this. He is mighty to save. In other translations, you might see God described this way. A victorious warrior. A warrior who can deliver. A warrior who saves. The Hebrew word for mighty is gabor. And that word refers to one who is a proven warrior. One who is valiant in battle. One who is a champion. The Hebrew word, the, the word save is the Hebrew word for yasha. This is really cool. Which is closely related to the word yeshua. From which we get our word Jesus. The root in Arabic is make wide, which underscores the main thought of bringing people to a place of safety or broad pasture. Now, why is God mighty to save? Well, Moses answered that this way in Deuteronomy 10, verses 17 and 18. The Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty. And there's that word gabor. And the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. I've got a question this morning. Had Moses witnessed firsthand God's ability to save? Absolutely. 
God protected the Israelites from the plagues that had been leveled against the Egyptian people. Whenever Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, God parted the Red Sea for the Israelites to cross on dry ground. In the midst of the wilderness wandering, God provided their daily meal from heaven. In their 40 years of wandering, the Israelites walked on shoes that never wore out. Man, I wish we had those today for our kids. <laughs> Man. You know, when it was time to enter the promised land, God promised them victory over their enemies. And God proved it by knocking down the walls of Jericho. We can go to Daniel and look how God spared him in the lion's den. We can go to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and have Jesus himself walk with them in the fiery furnace. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Let's fast forward to Jesus, our mighty warrior, who conquered sin and defeated death and hell on Calvary's cross. And when Christ's enemies believed they won, Jesus rose again on the third day. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he brings all who will call upon his name to a place of safety. Yes, our God is mighty to save. The third promise is he will take great delight in you. He will take great delight in you. Now, others translate it this way. He will exult over you with joy. Now, those two words, over you, are simply amazing. Bible scholar Dr. O. Palmer Robertson said, How could the sovereign creator concentrate his whole being in the love of a temporal creature of dust? How could the holy satisfy himself contentedly in the loving contemplation of the unholy? Well, my answer would be, for those who are children of God, we are in Christ. And God the Father doesn't see us as unholy sinners, but as saints. Now, let's make this even more personal and applicable. How many of you have pictures of loved ones on your refrigerator? Okay. Why do we do that? Well, my guess is because it's a place we visit several times a day. <laughs> you know, we open the refrigerator first thing in the morning. It's opened several times throughout the day, and it might be the last stop we make before bed. But here's the cool thing. Each time we face that refrigerator, each time we pull on that handle, we are blessed by the faces of those we love most in this world. If you know Jesus, you are a child of God. And if God has a refrigerator in heaven, your picture's on it. A young girl was having an unexpected slow recovery from an illness. And so she was admitted to the hospital. And her attending physician, he expected a quick recovery. And he couldn't figure out why she just wasn't getting better. So he realized that in talking with the young girl that she was a very sensitive child. She, she was easily scared. She was anxious. She was nervous. But she responded warmly to, to kindness and compassion. The doctor thought that maybe she was afraid of the nurses or the other medical staff or, or going through all of these tests or, or the unfamiliar surroundings and, and probably a combination of all. So the doctor determined he was going to do everything he could to help this young lady. So he wrote on her medical chart, this child requires loving every four hours. Listen, God's better than that. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. The fourth promise. 
He will quiet you with his love. This Hebrew phrase has been translated in various ways. He will quiet you with his love. He will be silent in his love. He will renew you in his love. His love for you will make everything new. Now, just quickly, I, I want to address the, the one translation, he will be silent in his love. Now, this is really cool. Whenever we invite Christ into our heart and life, he, he cleanses us of our sin problem, right? Well, see, God's not like people in that uh, sometimes people hold grudges. And even if we say that we forgive someone, the next time we're in an argument or a fight, we might say, and remember that last time. God doesn't do that. He remains silent in his love about our past transgression because he sees Christ living in us. But I'm going to focus, he will quiet you with his love. You know, ever since uh, we started having kids 16 years ago, um, many times at night I heard Delana singing to the kids, especially when they, when they were little. Now, some of these songs would be things like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, or Mary Had a Little Lamb, or back when Noah was just a toddler, some of the wiggle songs would come up from time to time. But more times than not, I'll hear her sing things like Jesus Loves Me. And it seems like this, I don't know, within the last maybe three or four years, there's one song that I hear coming out of that bedroom often, and it's, I believe it's no coincidence at all that Bonnie chose it for invitation today. And it's in Christ alone. My hope is found. And you know, she'll, she'll begin to sing with the kids after the story time is over. She begins to sing to the kids because she knows that, that, that finally they're about to drop off to sleep. And that singing quiets them with her love. You know, it not only works with children in my house, it also works with my dog. <laughs> we, have a, uh, we have a Boxador, which is a lab boxer mix, and um, she's 102 pounds. She's a big dog, and probably the, the best dog I've ever had. Um, she is truly a, a, a family pet. She, she wants to take care of her family. If someone comes to the door that... Uh, that she's not sure is supposed to be there. She will act like she's going to bite your, your leg off. But when that person is invited indoors and she realizes, okay, this is a friend, not a foe, she becomes your friend. And um, she's, she's a very brave dog. She, um, um, all of our bedrooms are actually at, at one end of the house together. And, and every night she sleeps on a sleeping bag in between all three bedrooms. Right there in the floor, in between all. And, and I, I believe she thinks I'm protecting the family. I think it's her purpose to sleep right there every night. Now, like I said, she's a very great dog and, and, and a good watchdog. But there's one thing that really scares her. Thunder. She hates storms. And uh, several years ago, a storm had arisen in the middle of the night. And uh, Dwight and I... We, we didn't know it was storming outside. We, we didn't hear it. But we, we soon realized what was happening when that 102-pound dog came leaping into our bed. <laughs> and uh, she snuggled up in between both of us. I mean, she, she was, that's where she was going to sleep. And there's no room in the bed for three of us that day. So, so we had to coax her down. And, and um, she, she sat by the side of the bed. And she kind of sat and put her paws on the side of the bed, thinking maybe it'll change their mind. And she did several times and push her back down. And, and finally, Jelena did something that I didn't anticipate at all her doing. She began to sing, Jesus loves me to Sam. She was sitting there petting Sam said, singing, Jesus loves me. And you know what? It works with animals too. <laughs> it wasn't long before Sam was, she, she had quieted she went back to her bed and she went back to sleep. Sam was quieted by the love of her owner. How much more does God want us to experience the quietening of his love? 
which leads in perfectly to the last phrase. He will rejoice over you with singing. Can you imagine what it must sound like to hear God sing? I mean, it'd be phenomenal. Um, the same God who spoke the entire universe into existence sings. And not only sings, but he loves to sing over his kids. That is incredible. I'll be honest with you. Uh, the first time that I was made aware of this verse was uh, back when I was in college at Southwest Baptist University. And uh, we were in a chapel that morning, and there was a lady speaking. Her name was Becky Castle, and uh, she was the head of the missions uh, department, and uh, she also headed up the, the small group for, for ladies on the campus. And she told a story that went along with Zephaniah 317. She said that, that a few days prior to her speaking that a, a young lady had come into her office, in fact, one of the girls that had been in her small group, and um, Becky asked her how she was doing, and she said, I am, I'm exhausted. I am totally exhausted. She said, I'm not sleeping at night. In fact, whenever I close my eyes and sleep, immediately I am plagued with some of the most horrific nightmares imaginable. I don't even want to discuss them with you. So Becky noticed then that right, she had you know, dark circles under her eyes and, and she didn't look well. And, and she said, do you have any idea why this is going on? She said, I don't have any idea whatsoever. She said, I know that God's been speaking to my heart about going on a mission trip and he's been speaking to my heart about possibly being a small group leader. And immediately she said, I think you're experiencing a major spiritual attack in your life. She opened her Bible to Zephaniah 3.17, which says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. She shared that verse with her, and she said, Had you ever heard that verse? She said, No, I haven't, but that's, a, that's really a word of encouragement. She said, Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this reference home with you, and I want you to, to read it throughout the rest of this day, and tonight before you go to bed, I want you to pray this as a prayer over your life that God will do what God says he will do. So that evening she began to, to, to look over the scripture in her back by, by nightfall. She had a memory. So 10 o'clock that night she went to her bedroom and she sat down on the edge of her bed and she prayed that verse as a prayer over her own life and she laid down and she fell asleep. Now two hours later she woke up it wasn't because of a nightmare. In fact, she was shocked that she had gotten two hours of, of peaceful rest. But she woke up realizing she heard music. So she assumed the roommate had left the TV on in the living room. And so she went in there and checked, and the TV wasn't on. Then she thought, okay, I know what it is. My roommate has left her radio on in her bedroom. So she, she peeked inside her roommate's door, and no, radio wasn't on. She went back to her bed and she sat down and she began to weep, realizing at that point what had happened, that God had honored his word and had sung over his child. That's phenomenal. That's what God wants to do in our life. Now listen, folks. These are promises that can be claimed, I believe, by children of God. I want to clear something up, though, first. Here as of, uh, I don't know, within the last couple of weeks even, I heard a, a, a newscaster on a morning news show, who I know she's a Christian, I've heard her testimony, but, but she was talking about something that was going on in the news and how sad it was, and she made the statement, well, we're all children of God. It's just not true. We are all created in the image of God. But we are not all children of God. That only takes place whenever you invite Jesus Christ into your heart and life. You know, I was thinking back to, how many like Andy Griffin? You know what's interesting? There are more hands that went up for Andy Griffin than having loved ones pictures on your refrigerator. <laughs> interesting. No, I was thinking back to an Andy Griffin episode where even this idea of, uh, of, uh, um, 
children of God and, and, and image of Anyway, it, it goes back to an episode where, where um, the, the star tenor of the community choir, he's out. And so the director comes over to the, the, the sheriff's office and he says, Andy, we've got a problem. And so he shares that they're, they're missing their star tenor for their community choir concert and competition. And, and uh, so they begin to brainstorm other people and, and, and there's no one. Well, Barney was in the back overhearing the entire conversation. And Barney comes out and he shares, um, well, you know what, I have this trained voice. You have a trained voice? And, and the director said, well, what part do you sing? Well, tenor. Tenor, you're exactly who we need. And so if you know the episode, you know that he goes to the first night of choir practice and immediately they figure out that that is not what they needed in the community choir. <laughs> He's coming in. And so, and so uh, you know, the director says, we've got to kick him out. And, and he says, oh, we can't kick him out the same day that we put him in. But it was up to Andy to figure out a way to get Barney out of the choir. So one night they're over at Andy's house and they're having dinner and, and Barney and Thelma Lou and Aunt B and, and uh, Andy and Obi all sitting around the table and, and Barney hops up from the table and says, let's go get some practice in. So they go sit down and he says, it's good on 14A. And so they sit down and, and began to sing and uh, the light bulb comes on in Andy's head. He's got an idea. He stops the music in the middle of the song and he says, uh-oh. So somebody hit a word, hit a bat no, oh, worse than that, Barney. So open your mouth. So Barney opened his mouth really wide. And he said, Oh. He said, You're sick. He said, You may not feel it yet, but you're sick. Don't you feel sick? Well, not too much. No, you're sick, Barney. He said, you, you, your throat's swollen up just like that back there in your throat. He said, You can't sing in the choir. He said, You don't want to get everybody else sick. You, you gotta go home and go to bed. Well, Barney and Thelma Lou leave, and on the way home, they stop at the dock office. <clears throat> Barney rushes back to Andy's house and said, guess what? I'm not sick. Andy said, well, who told you? Yeah, I know. He said, well, the doc did. Andy said, good old doc. <laughs> he said, no, when you're sitting in the back of my throat, it is an infection. It's supposed to be there. It's the uvula. He said, I've got a uvula, you've got a uvula, all God's children got a uvula. <laughs> and he says, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, the point of that is this, is even back then, obviously every person alive has a uvula. So it wasn't just all God's children had a uvula, everybody's got a uvula. So even in the 1960s, there was this idea that we are all children of God. And it's just not true. In fact, the Bible says this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath rests upon him. Why is that there? You see, this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says the wrath of God is currently resting upon you. That's a scary place to live. Now what does that mean? That means if you would die in the spiritual condition you are in, you would spend an eternity separated from God in the place the Bible calls hell forever. Did you know Jesus talked about hell more than he did heaven? It's an absolutely real place. Now, it wasn't created for you, but it becomes the destination of all people who refuse to accept Christ as personal Lord and Savior. You see, if you want to claim the promises found in Zephaniah 3.17, you got to be a child of God. Now, now how does that work? How, how do I become a child of God? Well, it's really quite easy. It's the ABCs. First off, you admit that you're a sinner. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room this morning have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Okay, now the rest of you put your hands up. Okay, we've all lied. Now, how many of you have ever stolen something, even if it was small or what you consider insignificant? Raise your hand. 
Okay, let me help. That would include borrowing your friend's paper when you were in school, looking over a friend's shoulder on test day. Okay? You know what we are? We are all a bunch of liars and thieves in this room this morning. We're sinners. For all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, what's the glory of God mean? The glory of God means perfection. Now, we have just proven this morning that there's not one perfect person in this room. So we admit we are a sinner. That, that should be simple because we just proved that we are. So, A, admit you're a sinner. Now, secondly, you believe. B, believe. Believe what? You believe that Jesus Christ came into this world, lived a perfect life, died a perfect sacrificial death, and he rose again on the third day, conquering death and hell, and, and that he is the only one who can take care of your sin problem. And he is the only one that can take care of your sin problem. Then there's C. In fact, I use two C's here. I do know my ABCs, but I use two. You confess Jesus Christ as Lord, and you commit your life to him. That's the ABCs of becoming a child of God. If you want to have, if you want to claim the promise of this God who sings over you, the serenading God, it starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask every head down, every eye closed. Quite possibly you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And you want to know this God who loves you enough that not only did he send his son to die on a cross for you, but as a father, he wants to sing over you. It starts by admitting you're a sinner, believing who Jesus is, and committing your life to him. I'm going to pray a little prayer this morning. And if you too want to invite Christ into your heart and life, I'm going to ask you to pray it along with me. And it goes something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I need your forgiveness. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and to come into my life today. And I pledge from this day forward that I will live for you. Now with your head still bowed and eyes still closed, would there, be ha would there happen to be someone here this morning that prayed that prayer for the very first time? Just slip your hand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call on you. Just say, yes, I prayed that prayer today. Maybe you're here this morning and uh, you realize that as a child of God, maybe you've been missing out on some of these promises. Maybe you've not been walking with Jesus like you should be, and you're just not where God wants you to be right now, and you realize that. And, and this morning, you want to just confess that sin and, and, and make yourself, and get back right with God again. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. And I want to thank you for your word. And I want to thank you that you are a God who loves us. That you are a God who, who is with us. That you are a God who is mighty to save. That you are a God who desires to quiet us with your love. That you are a God who sings over us. And God, this morning, if there are those who are missing out because they don't have a personal relationship with you, I pray that in this time of invitation that you will give them the courage and the boldness to come to this altar and to get things right. God, if there are other decisions that need to be made, people that need to be prayed for, that God, that, that you would also give freedom in this place, in this time, as we sing together this song in Christ alone. 
And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand this morning? We'll sing our invitation. <laughs> Yeah.